everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It is me and Nate, uh, and we are here. We're we're ready to talk. We're gonna do we're we're, we're gonna do our weather talk in the morning. Uh, you know, our our beginning weather talk, and uh, it, this time it's actually gonna be uh, prescient. So, Nate, how is the weather in Europe today? Well, I guess it's I don't know if you guys are gonna yeah. Pretty soon, you guys don't aren't gonna be uh, declared Europe anymore, right? Yeah, I mean, amongst the dads who read the sun, we're distinct from Europe. They're the continent. We are just Britain, the ruler of the world, uh, somehow. And uh, yeah, things are fine. I mean, it's back to what we would be pretty cool by Midwestern standards, but relatively like normal summer weather here, which is to say it's like in the mid to high 70s is the high. And there's one day this week where the low is supposed to get down to like 55. But I mean, I think I think uh, London weather is like comparable to Seattle weather in a lot of ways. Um, so, I mean, which if you are from the Pacific Northwest, you know that normally pretty mild, pretty rainy in the winter can be nice, but also can be really balls hot out of nowhere. And then you're like, wow, no one has air conditioning. This sucks. Um, so it's about the same. About the same. But uh, this past week, we had an all time hell uh, heat record in the United Kingdom. In Cambridge, it was, I want to say something along the lines of 37.9 or maybe 38 on the dot degrees Celsius, which is um, about 100 to like 102-ish, which is abnormally incredibly hot. Um, but that's nothing compared to Paris, which was at 42 Celsius, which was like 108 Fahrenheit, which is the hottest it's ever been there. Uh, there were similar, not quite as high, but similar heat records in the Netherlands, in Germany, um, in other parts of France, weirdly, the part of France where we were on vacation, which is the far south, right on the Mediterranean coast, which is quite hot, which was you know far more like hot summer weather when we arrived, it actually stayed about normal temperatures there. But for some reason, the center in the north of France got this insane amount of heat. So not good. Um, buildings here aren't built. I mean, it's like you can make fun of us because yes, I, I sometimes laugh at British people thinking it's a heat wave when it's eighty degrees Fahrenheit, but buildings here aren't built for this kind of weather they're, they're they're built to solidly retain heat ceilings are low and people i mean most people don't even have fans much less air conditioning so it's this if this becomes the norm it's going to be one of those things where you, lots of people are going to suffer and like the folks who have money uh will be able to get air conditioning the folks who don't are just going to suffer through hideous temperatures and this place is just kind of like not built for it so We're, but that also applies to the u.s military yeah well, I was going to say we're we're concerned about selling our house because it doesn't have central air. But we have three window units, and we we have a fourth one in the basement. If if like it got really bad, it just it you know like our house was built before indoor plumbing, so they built it with heat in mind, heat and cold. So uh, you know it 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 depends on the it depends on the house, it depends on the people that are in it. But but yeah, absolutely, there has been. Uh, it's been nice finally here as well, but that's awesome. Yeah, I spent like six hours out in the yard yesterday. I got a nice yard, and here I am trying to sell this fucking house. I'm just like look at look at all the fun I'm having over here, everybody. Come by my house. So you mentioned the military. Uh, yeah, the military is getting fucked by climate change as well, but not just the military. Like literally the world, but in ways that aren't necessarily just it's hot and and things and people are dying or. Uh, you know, heat waves and, and glaciers, like uh, the the rise of a lot of these uh, terrorist groups comes directly from climate change. Uh, so, so not only do we have that, but also, yes, like you said, in the U.S. military, let's let's handle the domestic first. Let's talk about the U.S. Army. Uh, and in a uh, an article that was sent to us. It's entitled U.S. Soldiers Falling Ill, Dying in the Heat as Climate Warms. And this is inside climatenews.org. I haven't really vetted this, uh, this site, but I do uh, know a lot about heat in the Army, as I'm sure that you fucking do as well, Nate. So this talks, yeah, th this talks about, you know, uh, doing, um, I guess, you know, doing trainings out in the heat. And even it, it points out to say, hey, this person, you know, was an Iraq war veteran. And, you know, ends up dying because of a heat, ca you know, his heat casualty. Um, and, and, and how, like, one, 
it's getting hot. We know that. And, and you know, those of us who have been to Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, when you're there, you get acclimated. You get, you know, and, and when I was in Iraq, I had a, you know, a set schedule of when I drank water, especially when I was just in the office. But if I was out and about, like, I always knew how much water I was intaking. I always knew what color my pee is. A very, it's, a very, it's a thing I had 10 years later I've yet to get rid of. Like, it's just like, woo, my pee is looking kind of dark. I better go drink some water, you know, saying that out loud at the baseball stadium. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, um, I guess, Nate, whenever the Army has told you that you're in a heat category five, has that ever changed your training that you're doing? Not really. The only time that I've ever been uh, in a situation in which they've changed the uniform and attended to, you know, heat cat in some capacity was when I was in, uh, shit, when I was in airborne school. In 2005, um, they, it got up to Heat Cat 5 pretty much every day. I went to airborne school um, the end of May through the beginning of June, which is, I was not prepared for how insanely hot that is in Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, and so once they declared Heat Cat 5, they made us, in some, some details, they had us take our blouses off, or they had us at least blouse our sleeves, like fold our, like roll our sleeves up, unblouse our boots, and cuff them so that they were open instead of tucked into our boots. Uh, like our, you know, like our pant legs. And um, obviously, like there would be formations where they would make us just down a whole thing of water. Like they would be like, all right, you know, this is the formation. Everybody open up a canteen and hydrate, drink the whole canteen. Uh, they would march us in formations, like in columns through um, this thing that was like a car wash and they just dump cold water on us. It was like a shower. <laughs> um, and that I didn't, I didn't know, which is the thing they do in basic training. What? No, they didn't. They didn't for me at Fort fucking Benning in July. Send me to the truth. Yeah, they, wash they, 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 as far as far as I understand, now this wasn't a wash rack. This was legitimately a thing on the airborne training site that was built for the sole purpose of marching formations of soldiers through to get wa- get to get hosed off with cold water. Um, so this this is that that was definitely a thing they did. But but I never experienced it in any other training I did in Korea. It got well above into Heat Cat Five, and I mean they they made us wear a duty uniform when walking around the training site at uh rodriguez range that was you know long sleeves uh long pants you know tucked into boots gloves uh f- what's it called a, a flick i can't remember what the acronym it stands for for flick but basically your equipment carrier and then a camelback and then eye protection and a hat so we were hotter than fuck but it was like well you got a you, you've got a camelback on your back so you'll be fine um so in that regard, I, I, I never really saw it change. But when I was in the Special Forces course, we had an ex, uh, 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 some incidents with regard to Heat Cat that legitimately killed a dude and injured like dozens and dozens of people. For people in my class who were retests on the pass fail land nav event not it was the star course part two basically you do the star course in selection and then you do it again in the q course on a different area of like the fort bragg general training area and i did it right before memorial day weekend and it was definitely heat cat five and they during the daytime and they definitely most certainly did not amend our packing list or uniform to, to attend to the heat so they did it again over the 4th of July weekend or right before the 4th of July weekend for people who had failed and had to retest and then also for the next class. And it was way, way, way worse that time. Uh, they basically didn't refill any of the water points because they, they basically set up water points on the map. They gave you the coordinates. And they're like, you know, it, you can hit these water points. Make sure you mop, mark them on your map. And they had, you know, w- like water cans, like five gallon water cans. Well, by 6 a.m., those things were completely empty at all the water points and they hadn't they, they didn't refill them. They didn't have like a duty cycle built into the training schedule where people were going to go out there and replace the water can. So people were showing up to these water points thinking they would get water and there was none. So they wound up having something like 70 heat cat people and they had to like send an emergency convoy back to Bragg to go to the special forces medic course barracks and just be like, everyone, everyone get in these trucks, go now. We've got it. We've got a medical emergency. They were requisitioning civilian pickup trucks to like transport people to Kazovac them because there were so many injuries. And an Air Force JTAC guy who was out there on his own, like voluntarily, he wasn't a student. He was just like, hey, I want to do land nav training with you guys. They let him out there. He died. And that was in 2012. Uh, And and it's only gotten worse. That weekend over the 4th of July weekend, uh, Fort Bragg or Fayetteville Airport had a heat record of like 107 or 108. 
So that gives you an, an idea of the kind of temperatures you're dealing with. And I'd also point out that uh, out there in, in that part of Fort Bragg, the training area, uh, a lot of it is pretty wide open exposed. So you're not really getting a lot of shade. Uh, it's like, I mean, there's, there's pine forest that's pretty spread out. And then there's like, uh, in, um, draws, there's really, really thick vegetation. But I mean, as I understand the story and this is apocryphal, so please don't, don't, you know, cancel me if some of these details are not quite correct. The, one of the senior medical people out there told the, the training NCO, do not do this. You're going to get somebody killed. And he's like, fuck you, sir. I'm going to do my, my training. And somebody died. So have seen it happen. And yeah, the, 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 the SF response, because the fucking, the Q course was full of morons at the time, and maybe still is, who knows, was basically, oh, you have weak genes. <laughs> you know, it's like, cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. We're, we, we, Green Beret eugenics. I love it. Yeah, man. The, the, uh, if you don't have the right skull shape to get into uh, the Q course, then what the fuck are you even doing there? So we, we talk about uh, heat categories. So the army has, uh, has well, the military has five heat categories now. Heat, ca- heat cat five is the only one that anybody ever gives a fuck about. And there's a thing that they use like to, to measure it called a wet bulb. Um, I've only seen wet bulbs maybe about three times in my life, four times in my career. Uh, generally because somebody else, like you don't really need one. You're on a military base and the military base is the one who tells you what the heat category is. So a wet bulb is a thing that measures not just temperature, but uh, barometric pressure. I think it, do- it does humidity and everything. Yeah, so, I actually, so I actually did a, a climatology meteorology class when I was in college, and we had to, we had to do wet bulb, dry bulb me- measurements. Basically, it's just uh, it's two thermometers, one with a wet piece of, piece of cloth around it that is continually like, wetted, and the other is dry, and that basically it, it lets it assess the temperature and relative humidity. Right. So... The, the the wet bulb test tells you um, not just the heat but the humidity, uh, yeah. and gives you the and gives you the category. Now I have a you know just a quick Google. I brought up uh, a thing from Fort Irwin, which is in California, which is in in the fucking desert. In the desert and hotter than shit. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's the basics of heat category. Um, so heat cat five is above ninety degrees Fahrenheit uh, for your for easy work like you know just walking. Um, doing some weapons maintenance. Uh, you can do 50 minutes of work and to 10 minutes of rest. And the, no, I'm, yeah. Um, yeah, that's moderate, right, that's right. Yeah, moderate is 20, 20 minutes of work to 40 minutes of rest. And hard work is 10 minutes of work to 50 minutes of rest. And uh, hard work is like, you know, doing, you know, have a pack on, running, jumping, doing, like, calisthenics is considered um, moderate, but, like, as soon as you put on, as soon as you put on, like, the full uniform and full battle rattle, you know, your your, your body armor or even just a load-bearing vest and, and everything, uh, that, that bumps your heat category up. And but I've never seen them give 10 minutes work, 50 minutes rest, ever, nope, ever. Ever. In any of the years I was in uniform, cadet for four years, officer for seven years, I've never seen the t- those time standards applied. Now, what I have seen... Because, uh, you know, on, on deployment, you're just in a constant heat category five anyway for like 10 months out of the year. You know, there's smart planning you can do. Like, you know, uh, the, the, the MRAPs that we had, you know, thankfully that, you know, they were getting ones out there that had air conditioning. Um, always had like extra water going out with us, like, you know, cold water, not just, you know, in, uh, not just in jerry cans or anything. Uh, they had, you know, it, it's smart. They just had, they, they, they thought ahead for it. And like I said, when you're there, you're acclimated. But when you come home, like I am now, where I'm, you know, all fat and comfortable and haven't, you know, been in a war zone in the last decade, you know, 100 and, 110 degrees or even 100 degrees and running, jumping, putting on body armor, running around doing shit is going to break me the fuck off. Uh, and you're, you're going to have that as well. And that is where, where people end up dying is when you don't have, you don't have NCOs, you don't have officers doing the uh you know the necessary like forward planning for it and you know even though land navigation is would be considered like a probably a a light to moderate it's still it's still hot and you're still wearing all that shit and you know if you're walking through a wooded area or a place with a lot of high grass i mean that takes it's not you know Walking on uneven surface like that is not the same as walking on, you know, concrete or, or you know, a sidewalk or something. So that takes that that takes part of it. And so it just always seems like there's a lot of um, 
uh, a lot of things that are not considered. And then we have what you had, like somebody didn't bring extra water. Somebody uh, wasn't planning on these things. And then you have like, you know, uh, 20 heat casualties and a death easily. Uh, and that is, you know, like I said, I've never, you know, I've been in for 20 years. Um, I went to, I went to basic at Fort Benning and they gave us shaded areas basically, which was nice. You know, um, when we we're doing marksmanship or when we we're out, you know, doing, doing stuff, there was always a, like, you guys are the ones who are doing the training, right? You know, here, this group's doing the training and everybody else is going to be over here doing some hip pocket training in the shade. You know, our drill sergeants were smart about yeah. that. I mean, they had to be because it was, you know, it was Benning. They knew. Um, I'm sure the the school of fucking infantry knew about that shit. And and yeah, you know, there is like a look. You're gonna have to suck it up and deal with the heat, but you know, not to an extent where you fucking die. Uh, and, and you know, we're just like, you know, drill sergeants like that are prepared for it because I'm sure that they've been briefed and I'm sure that they've been sat, you know, sat down before they come out there and be drill sergeants out there. Like, look. It's Benning, it's July, it's Georgia, it's hot, it's humid. Everything is red clay out here. Understand, you know, that you need to to keep your your troops like hydrated and, you know, rested and cooled off especially during the really hot days. Then you have dipshits like, you know, your NCO that you were talking about who's just like, "No, nah, I'm going to go do whatever the fuck I want." and hasn't made any of these considerations. And you know, just like you know, we have these we climate change is happening. We already know that. It's getting hotter. And if you yeah. know the if if the leaders, you know, just even down like not even like, you know, generals and shit, the leaders down to your your regular ass, you know, E fives, E sixes, and E sevens can't take a moment to be like, ah, uh, you know, make sure you pack extra water. You're just gonna have more of these problems. And it's not just on troop level. I mean, our fucking military bases are getting fucked uh there's a uh uh a survey that was done of like 76 major military bases and like two-thirds of them are at some sort of climate change risk whether it's forest fires whether whether it's flooding uh any you know anything like that any any base that you have on the ocean is built to be like okay the ocean is this high uh at its highest tide therefore this is how high we have to make the uh we have to make the the, the base as soon as uh you know the the water levels start going up all those bases are fucked and there's nothing you can do you can't raise them up you can't put some fucking you know floor jacks at the bottom of the ocean and raise up san diego uh you're just going to be hosed and nobody's prepared for that and that i think that that's you know when i when i imagine uh when i dream of the uh american imperialism downfall uh just our own like piss poor planning is a huge part of it where you know like Tyndall Air Force Base which got hit by um a uh, a hurricane last year which still is has not been put back together you know uh all, all we need all we need is our major military bases to go down uh and i i really i it just feels like you know the 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 people who are in charge like there's the people who are smart and kind of up there who are like, this is bad and we need to do something about it. And the people who are in charge are like, eh, we don't have the money for it. So we're just going to go ahead and not do anything. And it's just, I don't understand, you know, what kind of forward planning that you have here in 20 to 30 years. If you want to maintain this whole, you know, uh, military superpower thing when all of our shit starts going underwater. Yeah, I mean, I, so th this article in Inside Climate News is really, it, it's, it's quite in-depth and it, it tells a number of stories. And I mean, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, you have stories of reservists dying doing land nav, you have a story of a reservist dying after a run, um, you have the active duty soldiers, soldiers in basic training, a West Point cadet, so many of these people who, you know, it was hot and they knew what was happening and uh, it was, yeah, it, 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 they didn't really pay attention until it was too late. And I mean... It's interesting to me because I think about where most American military bases are in the United States, you know, in, in the, the, the lower 48 states. They're almost entirely in the South, which are going to be strongly affected by this. But even in that story, like I just related, there's a guy at West Point in upstate New York, basically, or the Hudson Valley of New York doing training, and he dies of heat cat. Because it's still hot in the summer up there, it, even if it's not as hot as, I don't know, like Fort Shafter or Fort Campbell, Kentucky, Fort Benning, Georgia, you know, those places, it's still hot as hell. And 
it's it, it's all preventable if you're paying attention and you're actually checking up on people. But if you don't know what's happening, and you don't know what to look for, or you just don't care because you, you treat it like a formality or that anyone who falls out from heat is weak, then you shouldn't be surprised when you kill people. And I mean, like I said, I've I've seen a lot of people go down as heat cats. And to be honest with you, the places where I've seen it happen the most often are places where the training is sort of like, you're going to do this or you're going to fucking fail because people don't want to fail. Like if it's in ranger school or it's in special forces course or it's in, I don't know, like a, my basic officer leader course uh, two, but bullet two course, our barracks were right next to the, uh, what's it called? Um, rap barracks, the or rip, excuse me, uh, ranger indoctrination program. So basically the, 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 the selection for ranger privates that they go to after airborne school. So all just in shape privates getting the dog shit smoked out of them all day long by ranger instructors. And the way they treated those kids. Oh, I saw a kid go down as a heat casualty. I was thinking about this the other week when it was hot here. I saw a kid go down as a heat casualty and the instructors came up to him and started slapping him in the face, trying to wake him up and just like yelling at him. And one of our fellow lieutenants who was prior service, like E6 medic jumped in and was like, I'm, if I have to give you a direct fucking order as a second lieutenant, I will, but stop hitting that soldier and let us ice him. And it was this weird moment because here were a bunch of NC, former NCOs who'd, who'd been NCOs up until they graduated OCS like three weeks prior or six weeks prior or whatever, having to jump in and be like, stop doing what you're doing. You're going to kill this kid. And if, if they legitimately, if they hadn't pulled rank and if our major, who was our instructor, hadn't shown up and gotten involved, these guys would have been like, no, fuck you, sir. I can do what I want. And they probably would have killed this private or seriously injured him. And so I, I'm not saying this is like a, a blanket diss on, on soft or hard training or anything. What I'm saying more is that those kinds of situations where this happened, people don't really take it seriously until until it becomes past the point of being so obviously emergency that they lose their mind. Like, like they don't see it when the guy is weak and wobbly and not sweating anymore, or turning red, having a headache. Then he's just weak genes. But all of a sudden, when he's pacey white or turning blue and foaming at the mouth, then they're like, oh, whoops, maybe we should have given him water. And I think a lot of this stuff the climate change aspect of it is real and it's making it more dangerous. It's making training more dangerous, no matter what. It's making operations more dangerous. But the, a, a lot of the, the attention to this has to come to people actually taking what we already know about heat stroke seriously. You know what I mean? Like You can avoid it if you know what you're looking for and the people at like the touching point of training know what to look for and aren't assholes. But it's amazing to me how often that gets forgotten. There is certainly a progression. If I'm out and I'm, you know, doing hot weather shit, running around, being being a troopy and whatnot, and I start to feel, you know, overheated. Hey, I need to go, I need to slow down. I need to go sit in some shade, drink some water, drink some Gatorade, get a little salt in me, because that's another big thing. Um, some of these in, in, on the, um, uh, the article from Inside Climate uh, Change, has people that you know died from drinking too much water, uh, because it's just it's so hot and you just drink water, drink water, drink water, and that can literally kill you, like being too too hydrated, or not putting not putting salt into yourself. Like when I did when I did my warrior leadership course for you know which is sergeant school, um, they ran us. It was Nebraska and it wasn't hot. Like it was probably right at about ninety degrees maybe, but it was really humid and. Um, before we went out, I, you know, I took, I took what I knew about, uh, spending time in the desert because I had just gotten back from Iraq and, uh, shoved a big thing of, um, sunflower seeds in my pocket and was handing that. And I told everybody, it's like, everybody needs to, you know, be eating sunflower seeds as well as drinking water or eating your MREs. I don't care which, but you gotta, you gotta do that because that progression, you know, me as somebody who, who stays in tune with my body, I know like, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting heat exhaustion, which is like the first thing where you're just, where, where you're just like completely, you know, uh, you're overheating, but you're not like, it's not dangerous yet. Like it's not deadly. It's not deadly until it hits heat stroke. And the thing is, is that like, not every soldier has the ability to say, to, to feel that, you know, to know what their body is doing. I, you know, I've, I only have experience because I've had heat exhaustion before and, you know, had to sit down and, and, you know, uh, put, put cold, uh, cold towels on my, um, on my, the back of my neck. And then, you know, it's like, okay, I feel better now I can go back. You know, it was like, a, Oh, I overheated. I fucked up. Um, but I can, you know, after about sitting down for 30 minutes and cooling off in the shade, 
getting a little bit of moving air on me and a little bit of cold water. Uh, now I can, you know, get back in the fight, as uh, as our illustrious uh, commanders would say. Uh, but yeah, you don't have, you know, if you don't have your your NCOs looking out for people like that, uh, climate change is going to start fucking killing soldiers left and right even more. Uh, and it's and it's preventable is the thing that pisses me off. It's and not not just preventable in like you know you know uh, behead your local oil baron, but you know preventable as in hey just you know drink water, stay in the shade, follow the the rules of like if you're doing you know really really hard work to take breaks and take long breaks on a regular basis. Yeah, I was thinking about this too because there's a quote in that Inside Climate Change uh, or Inside Climate News article about a guy saying, "Well, if you want to fight in the heat, if train in the heat, you have to push through it. Like, you know, there's a fine line, but you know, we have to we have to do this training because this is the conditions we fight in." Which I get, but I'm going to say this: we had soldiers in my battalion go down as heat casualties during like multi-day operations, but it was rare. And one of the reasons why is that because NCOs are given autonomy to take care of their soldiers when it's in a unit versus in training when you're sort of at the behest of, you know, I mean, in some cases you can, but in other cases, like, you know, it, you're at the behest of the, or at, at, at the the whim of the instructors. Um, you know, like like you were saying, giving people salt, giving people Gatorade, like having them take, uh, they, 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 they do um, rehydration salts, which were a um, a thing that we used to get in the Special Forces course that that helped a lot. That they're basically packets that would be typically be given out in like relief packages uh, for people with like dysentery or diarrhea or things along those lines. And they're basically like a sweetened kind of like almost not quite milkshake. It makes something that kind of tastes like watered down Gatorade, but it's really really salty. And this helps a lot to like r- basically restore electrolytes in your body when you've gone through something that's depleted them. Um, so, so things like that, if you're just paying attention to that shit, you can, you can mitigate this quite easily. Um, but I think what's interesting too is the, the military was basically shamed into admitting that although it had a report on which installations it thought were uh, going to be affected m- the most by climate change and climate, you know, cl- related disasters, it wasn't until they underwent a significant amount of public pressure that they finally re- released one, which was mostly redacted because like the Marine Corps was like, we're not going to release any of our bases, that kind of stuff. But you realize that not only is climate change going to be a problem for m- the military's ability to train safely, it's also going to be a problem just in terms of installation management in the sense that a lot of these places are in the sort of danger zone for being affected by inclement weather that's made worse by climate change. And I think the biggest one uh, we saw very recently was related to hurricanes, which are getting worse in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast um, because of climate change. For example, Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. Um, But then there's also, I mean, I, I think about places that I know of that are very much within like the potential disaster zone for climate change in the military. And just off the top of my head, I can think of like Naval Air Station Key West, Naval Air Station Pensacola, Fort Gordon, which is not on the coast, but it's close enough that it, it could be hit. To some extent, Fort Benning, I mean, they have to cl- close close places down, close close training down during hurricane season sometimes. The place where we do the swamp phase of Ranger School, I, I can't remember it anymore, but Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, which is also where 7th Special Forces Group is, that whole area is super susceptible to in the Florida panhandle. Um, parts of like areas around coastal Texas or even inland in Texas could potentially be hit. Um, you know, you look at the stuff and it's like, like a lot of the things on the Atlantic coast or like the mid Atlantic, like the, the, was it Virginia beach, that area, like all the Navy stuff on the Atlantic coast, like so many of these places could essentially get, you know, you, you could find yourself in a situation where you're, you're, they're spending even more absurd amounts of money on the military budget, you know, repairing shit constantly because it keeps getting destroyed. Uh, because we now have far more regular occurrences of destructive hurricanes like, I don't know, Hurricane Michael or Hurricane Andrew or Hurricane Katrina or things like that. Yeah, and not all of our stuff is really built to 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 last against stuff like no. that. Um, I mean, hell, we've got, you know, the even the, the permanent party housing on bases. If you if you go back far enough, we talked to somebody who was uh, who's out at Fort Carson and uh you know, waiting for the, the military or at least the people who were, you know, the, the, the contractors who were hired by the military to, you know, fix things that, that came after a storm and just nothing's being done about that. And, you know, it's, 
I don't know. It's it just seems like it's easy to. I don't know if it's like one of those things that's easy to ignore, uh, or if in general, like the 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 population doesn't give a fuck, or if you know it just happens so much. Like I mean, there was just a, recently. I don't know if you've read another you know mass shooting in in America at a garlic festival of all places, and you know it's just kind of a oh like my <laughs> as fucked up as it is. My first thought was like oh it's been a while since we had one of those. Um, rather than like, oh my God, how horrible is it that like a man walked in and killed, you know, three people and wounded 15 and, you know, shot a child and, um, you know, you you just, you get used to it. And that, that really seems to be like what it is with, with the military. It's like, well, I mean, our army is still strong. Right. And, and if you, if you zoom back far enough, sure, it looks like that. But if you zoom in, like, it's not hard to, to see like massive cracks in the system forming and uh and getting ready to 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 split and break and you know have the whole thing fall apart and i don't know if the military will or what is going to be the final catalyst of it but certainly climate change is not going to help it especially because climate change uh is a huge driver of um you know overseas uh i don't want to say it's a huge driver of terror but it is a thing that helps recruit people because in a um, in another article that we have here from the defensepost dot com, um, there was a one of the one of the things in here that I didn't realize that they talk about is the Syrian civil war was predated by a ten year drought in the area, and how you know drought in that area is really fucking over a lot of people, and you know when you're a farmer or you're you know a person who's you know scratches out a living from the land and requires water and nothing's happening you're not able to grow anything or you're not able to grow anything to a point where you can make money uh and then somebody comes by and says hey come join our group take this gun up and you and your family will never go hungry again uh you know what do you do um also i mean i would say too that a lot of the stuff drives migration to other countries which is a huge source of tension there both migration to europe for example but also migration to other countries say within the middle east uh or if you look at what's the air called the sahel and basically the sort of fringe of the sahara desert like south of the sahara desert in uh in places like burkina faso mali chad um other countries in the region there's advancing desertification in what used to be fertile farmland and that's driving a significant amount of people out of their you know ancestral homes and forcing them to relocate and you know that that's in north Af- not north africa but sort of like north central africa um or west africa this is driving you know recruitment and terrorism amongst things, groups like say boko haram like you said, in Syria, in Iraq, there have been massive droughts in that area that have affected things. And these people are, you know, their lives and livelihoods are very much contingent upon a successful harvest each, each year. And elsewhere in the world, in climate zones, I mean, you think about uh, places like migration um, or some of like the fractures that have taken place in, in like the Indian subcontinent. Uh, you know, th- those areas are being hit very hard with 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 ho- massively increased temperatures, you know, delayed monsoons or extremely heavy monsoon rains, things along those lines. Those are areas where migration has significant geopolitical consequences. Um, and I mean, look at where I live in fucking fortress Europe. It's the same sort of thing. Uh, if if climate change continues to worsen as we expect it to, it's going to make the migrations that happened in, say, 2015 look very small by comparison. And you've seen how just full fash people have gone in, as a response to, you know, uh, basically a million migrants coming to Europe. What is it going to look like when that number is 10 or 20 fold? I mean, I, I, I think children of men, them doing migrant extermination camps is probably going to happen in Europe, which is horrifying to think of. But seeing how insane most people are in this, in this region, in this country, in Britain, but also in, in Europe in general, how bloodthirsty and insane they all are about this and how just burn my own house down to own the libs mentality is not just confined to America. I expect that you're going to see just like the camps on the border in America and the, you know, terrorizing and and humiliating families and torturing children to like own migrants. That's going to become even more the norm or look at Australia, a country also similarly very heavily affected by climate change, uh, who's decided that asylum seekers get put on hell prison Island instead of even being allowed to touch Australian soil. 
And that's become such a normalized position that only only like the Green Party and the Socialist Party, none of the major mainstream parties in Australia are are even voicing any opposition to that. It's just like basically concentration camps for migrants and, and re- refugees is the norm in a lot of developed countries now. And it's only going to get worse with climate change. Yeah. And I mean, it's we as, as leftists and as, as socialists, um, we should be doing the eco socialism thing, uh, which I mean, eco socialism is basically just social. If, if you do a socialism, then the uh, then, then the world, you know, uh, climate gets better, which eh, questionable, but you know, we can, that, that's, that's a, uh, a deep well, socialism is an, uh, as an alternative to eco fascism, which right. basically says we have to preserve the environment. So we need to murder refugees. Yeah. Eco-fascism and that, that, that is shit, what we're doing. That shit is on the fucking rise. I gotta be honest with you. That stuff is the, the eco fascist messaging in the sense of it's explicitly being framed and kind of like, like you see these stickers, uh, popping up in Europe, particularly in Britain that say things like, uh, plant more trees, save the bees, deport refugees. And it's like, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? But yeah, that even, mentality is very, very common. And yeah. it's places like Denmark that are nominally left in terms of like their current government is, is headed by a further left figure than has been in, in, in power in a while is explicitly anti-refugee, deport the refugees, anti, anti-immigration. Yeah, even, even the right wingers, like I've, I've seen, uh, you know, friend of the show and, and, noted uh deep thinker fucking ben shapiro turn around and be like well i mean the problem is but with you know we just don't know what to do about climate change like okay so we're we're admitting it now as just a because it it wasn't it it wasn't a thing that anybody wanted to admit to until they could one make money off of it which of course you know uh as we can see the uh hey climate change means it's gonna uh break apart some icebergs and we'll have new shipping lanes and and also yeah hey the Things are getting bad. You know, things are bad in America because of climate change. And can we really, you know, afford to take more people in? Can we really afford to bring bring all these people in? Uh, you know, in these countries that we've been that one are probably suffering from climate change, but two also suffering from you know imperialism of of America. You know, just the regular you know central uh, Central America, uh, all those countries coming up because the CIA just loves to use that as its party grounds. But also because those places have been significantly affected by climate change, too. I mean, you have in Central America, you have the combination of a bad, significant drought, problems with farming, you know, soil degradation, incredible social upheaval because of gang and violence problem, most of which is driven by the drug trade. Most of that is driven by America's incredible demand for cocaine. Uh, And so these people are leaving because it's dangerous and they aren't able to eke out a living farming because either it's they, they they aren't making money, their farms are unproductive, or it's too dangerous for their families. And I mean, I I've been to Honduras. I spent a lot of time in Honduras and El Salvador. I don't blame any of them. I understand exactly why they'd want to leave. And that's driving like what you were just describing the sort of Ben Shapiro's of the world to just basically explain away concentration camps. Yep, they're necessary to keep the rest of us safe. And which is which, which honestly, your safety doesn't fucking matter to me if it means that you have to you know imprison or kill or let other people die or send them back to hell worlds that we created for them uh as kind of a whoops sorry you know we we've got to we've got to send you back to this to to basically die uh or we've got to pick you up and send you to a country that you don't know um you know just because uh you're an undocumented person who came here when they were th- when you were 3 years old well sorry guess what you got to go back to colombia now even though you're 40 years old like the eco fascism is you know it, it is a it is just a thin veneer on top of just regular fascism it's just using uh ecology as an excuse it's using fear i mean that's what fascism is you're a fascist because you're afraid no matter how much like jerking off you do onto your gun and how much you know you wish that you could fucking go out and you know shoot people for for god or whatever the fuck it is that fascists love to love to think about or love to you know watch uh i've seen a lot of people watching the russian police beat protesters and be like oh you know once 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 the president declares antifa as uh, a terrorist group which none of those are things that the that anything happens uh then the police will be able to treat you know antifa like this or be able to treat protesters like this and it's like i don't care like what all that is is based in fear you're afraid of something and you want 
you want a strong arm to come down. You want somebody who's not necessarily, probably not you. You want somebody to come down and shoot somebody you don't like or beat up somebody that you don't like and put somebody in their place to where, you know, you no longer feel unsafe and you get to go back to whatever fucked up vision of America that you think is, is in the back of your head, which doesn't exist. Here in the United Kingdom, it's the exact same phenomenon as is in the United States. The, the people who are pushing the hardest and banging the drums the loudest for deportations and th- basically the harassment of, of immigrants and refugees, um, the kind of people who don't even, who, who pride themselves on the fact that they reject r- refugee resettlements from people who have already you know, gone through all the 180 means tested fucking vetting processes that various agencies you know, have subjected them to. Those people live in they're, 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 they're old white boomers who live in places with almost zero immigrants and they just get a, a direct drip feed of, of hatred and xenophobia from, you know, Fox News in the United States and things like the British tabloids here or even some of the, 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 the I mean, the, the broadcast media here is bad, but it's not as bad as the, the absolutely fucking banana shit that gets published in tabloids, for example. And so the the demonization of refugees and immigrants and of anyone who isn't white or any even even in britain white immigrants who aren't from the united kingdom you know people like from eastern europe um from places like romania poland the baltic states stuff like that th- th- those people who are white and christian are also demonized because these people th- this country is full of morons they can't even do racism right or maybe you could say they do racism to such a degree that they're also racist, that th- they're willing to sink their own economy to be racist against white people. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. But all of it comes back to fear and uh, a kind of weaponized sense of us versus them. I've got mine, you shouldn't have yours. All of which is, is, is very captivating in a sense that it, it gets people roped in and it makes them want to watch more and it makes them think that you know it, like they've been turned on to a sort of QAnon conspiracy like we make fun of the QAnon people but is, is QAnon really all that much removed from the way that Fox News makes people think that like secretly Obama has like a tunnel to Mecca or whatever the fuck they believe you know what I mean like it, it, so there is such big business and so much money involved in pro um propagating these conspiracy theories and you know weaponizing national identity and racial identity and so you watch this stuff happen and it has real consequences for innocent people i mean i'm i'm full on open border socialist at this point man i I mean borders are an arbitrary artificial construction they haven't existed in their current form for very long we never had them before we didn't need them We, we don't need them if you care about smuggling, there's ways to go about that. If you care about human trafficking, there's ways to go about that. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see less human trafficking if people don't need human fucking traffickers to get them to places. But full on, I don't, I don't give a shit. D- get rid of passports, get rid of borders. But watching the way that this stuff gets played out, it's such big business. And people want to, I don't know, like they, they, they I don't want to rant or go on a tirade here, but people think that you can reason with these people and you can't. And the, the two reasons you can't reason is number one, I don't want to compromise with someone who literally believes that, that someone doesn't have rights as a human because, um, because they were born in Central America or they were born in South Asia or wherever the fuck, you know, I don't, I don't want to compromise with that person. I don't, I, I, I don't give a fuck what they think. And secondly, the thing that gets me about it is that if you start compromising with them now, it's going to get worse and climate change is going to get worse. What is that going to look like? Yep. And that's, you know, the, the biggest problem with the Democrats is they're always trying to do a hand across the aisle. And uh, the, the, the other side doesn't meet you halfway. They ever. just keep ever. Their, Not ever. They just keep their hand where they're at. And then so you're just like, well, I'll just put my hand further that way. And then all of a sudden we're, we're, we're yeah, doing you give all them, this. You, give them, you, you start out by offering them three quarters of the loaf and then they just turn around and be like, the Muslim Obama. And yeah. like, it just happens over and over again. Yeah, I don't like I, I'm, sh- you know, I'm sure there are you know, normal brained conservatives out there. Um, but I'm going to default and say that if you're a conservative, you're probably a dipshit at this point. Or at well, least if, if you're, you're still not- a conservative and you're still paying attention, then yeah, how can you look at this stuff and be like, oh, this is all normal. Yeah. Or if you're still like a Trump supporter, like I, I will, I will say like, um, I did know when, last time I had to do a work trip and I was talking with, uh, with a guy and he's just like, yeah, I'm conservative. And 
And this is like right after Trump um, was inaugurated, I think, or was was elected. And he's just like, I mean, I'm a conservative and I voted for Trump because I'm a conservative, but I was not fucking expecting this. And I want to go back to him now. And I'm like, were you expecting this? Because I don't think anybody was. Uh, and and you know, he's like, hey, you don't have to vote for anybody, as it turns out. Because let me tell you something. If I go and it's Trump versus Biden, I ain't voting for anybody either. Um, but yeah, that's... That, that that is that is where that is where we're at and that's why the left is necessary because uh i don't think we're i don't think leftists are going to ever be organized well enough to have like a a real political party at least not in not in any time frame that matters at this point to to save the world which is why you know for for everybody who's like oh well you shouldn't attack the democrats you, why aren't you attacking the conservatives like, bitch, I know the conservatives are bad. I like, I don't need to attack them. There, there's nothing to attack there. They're a bunch of shitheads. I understand that. Uh, however, the people who are supposed to be like trying to represent me, those people are a bunch of fucking assholes. And I need to yell at them because if they want my vote, they need to stop being assholes. They need to worry about Medicare for all. They need to worry about climate change in like a way that is not just, uh, oh, well, we're going to, you know, do carbon taxes for all these companies that put out too much carbon it's like man you can't there extra taxes ain't going to scrub the atmosphere you know you need to have like a uh, a, con, a concentrated effort of like okay the entire state of wyoming is now just going to be a forest that's all we're doing everybody moves out of wyoming and that's going to be our the state that scrubs the air with prairie and forest or or whatever like you know vast swaths of california need to go back towards like, you know, at this point we need a radical change and I don't trust the Democrats to do it. Um, I know the Republicans won't do it uh, because everything that's, that, that I propose is going to cost money and not make money. And because I don't give a fuck about money anymore. I give, I give a fuck about it in a way that like I need it to survive. But like when it comes to like, but what about our deficit? What about this? Like a deficit ain't going to matter once the world's on fire like i don't know what i don't know what to tell you once once the the government infrastructure collapses in on itself i don't know where the deficit's going to matter you know we could be we we could triple the deficit right now it's not going to fucking matter it's just a number that's made up that nobody that the only the only time people give a fuck about it is when a democrat is in power and they're screaming about the deficit you know and we're we're just gonna double it now, but over but we're we're doubling the deficit now for racism. I'm fairly sure that we can triple it for uh you know climate and ecology. Uh, we could also just tax the fuck out of people who haven't been taxed normally in 40 years and make a shitload of money, and that would also maybe you know wouldn't drive the deficit up as much. But no one ever does that because that's communism, and then the Republicans come in and just blow up the deficit, giving you know racism and tax cuts. And yeah, man, I mean it's uh it's. It's depressing because the thing that gets me is that over the course of this discussion, I was thinking about this, that, you know, the, the, the part of the, that story about uh, from Inside Climate News talked about how military doctors and military researchers, you know, have to choose their words very carefully because obviously the government is staffed by wet brained idiots and coal barons. And so again, the government acknowledging that climate change is a risk brings with it some potential consequences for them because they may find themselves chastised or punished for uh, for saying that climate change exists because actually it's a it's a it's a a secret Chinese propaganda plot, according to our, our president, who is has the brain power of a poodle that sh eats its own shit, vomits it up and then eats it up again. Um, but the thing is, is that the military is having to deal with the, the, the realities of that. They're having to adjust things and make plans to accommodate the fact that the climate is getting worse and more hostile. My concern is that what you're going to see is over the course as of the next decade, as the effects of climate change become more and more difficult to deny, not all of our all the conservatives are going to change their minds because some of them are just going to lie themselves to the grave. I mean, that's how they are. They, 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 they've been lying about the fucking Laffer curve forever, even though it's very obviously not true. But there are going to be a number of people who shift from climate change denial to eco-fascism. And the problem is, I think, for us is to be able to discern because liberals can't discern because they're morons because they, they just they see a thing they're like oh they say plant trees and even though like the fine print also says you know deport everybody who isn't white and the thing is is that you're going to see a lot of nominally ecologically minded policies that are actually trojan horses for more xenophobia anti-immigrant sentiment and racism does that make sense yeah 
I mean, that's that's the whole point. You're going to see of more of it. You're going to see more of that because it's going to become harder and harder to deny climate change. And I feel like leftists, what we should do is obviously continue to organize as we are and to put pressure as much as we can, but also to be vigilant because liberals will always accommodate fascists. But the problem is, is that some some things are so intolerable to even liberal voters that they're going to complain. But if the right, which we shouldn't underestimate, has smart people working for it, smart, craven, hideous, morally compromised people, they're going to try to find ways to couch racism, xenophobia, nationalism, etc. in ecology, because they're going to see that that's where the trend is going. And, you know, the identity Evropa fucking dipshits, among others, are going to try to weaponize that as well. And that's the kind of thing that, that we have to be really vigilant for, because, I mean, there are, not all of them, but there are, you know, a, 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 a cadre, or a cast of people in America whose politics you might describe as like John Bircher Republicans, but with dreadlocks. They care a lot about the environment, but they don't give a shit about anything else. And they're totally fine with the state crushing and oppressing people as long as it saves, you know, a pine forest or a turtle. Every, everything, every um, disaster is going to be picked up by conservatives and the fascists to uh, spin in their own direction. And that's that climate change is just the next one. They deny, deny, deny until somebody's just like, wait, but we can use this for racism. And then this is like, ah. Well, climate change means we have to be racist to everybody. Sorry. Sorry to tell everyone, but got to do a racism now because the earth is dying. So better, you know, we better like, like, I understand that, like, you know, uh, the, the definition of uh, ethnic cleansing and, you know, Holocaust or whatever uh, are couched in very specific terms. But I got to I got to say, like. It is literally ethnic cleansing to uh, to just be like, sorry, a billion people have to die for the rest of us to live comfortably, uh, and that is very much an America thing. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know. About, you know, history is is a is a very wonky thing that is. Um, you know, it, history is a thing that happened, but is interpret interpreted by different people uh, and interpreted in different ways. And I'm just always very curious, like, if there is a civilization in 500 years from now, what, what is going to be, you know, where is it going to be and what's going to be said about the American empire? Uh, is the American empire going to be a global empire at that point? And we're, you know, fucking doing, uh, we're doing imperialism in space or will everything have collapsed and, uh, you know, we're, we're everybody, you know, people are just kind of back, back to banging rocks together or something. It'll be interesting. I'll be dead for it, but it'll be interesting to know uh, what one one day maybe. I, I I still hold out hope. I mean, I live in the Midwest, and apparently, uh, according to all climate like you know um, surveys that are done, like I'll be fine. Uh, well, I mean, it'll be hot, but I'll be I will survive the oncoming. You know, because well, I I live far enough away from the rivers that the, the flooding's not going to bother me. The uh, you know hurricanes don't really come up here. Uh, it's all going to work out until that fucking earthquake hits and then just oh, say, yeah, the, <laughs> and then the, the uh, new Madrid fault earthquake that's going to destroy the Midwest. Right. It's going to like the, <laughs> the way that it's going to go is that like all the coasts are going to get covered with water. Everybody's going to be running inland, you know, and, and then, you know, St. Louis will become St. Louis and Chicago will become like the hub cities of, of America. And we'll be like, yes, finally people are paying attention to St. Louis and the new Madrid's going to hit the arch is going to fall into the river and wash out to the ocean. And like the last whale is going to choke to death on it, trying to eat it. And then it's just, and then the world, then, you know, I guess, uh, whoever's left in, in Russia is just going to, I don't know, shoot the nukes or something, a fitting end to everything I would say. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I see it here because, you know, so Britain has a housing crisis and the primary driver of Britain's housing crisis is the fact that jobs that pay above starvation wages are concentrated in cities, particularly around London. Uh, wages have been stagnant and have actually been decreasing versus inflation since 2008. They have not recovered even to the point where they were in terms of purchasing power in 2008. And also in the last 40 years, the government has sold off 
a, a significant amount of government owned housing, which at, at its peak was about 70% of people in this country lived in, um, but they haven't built any new housing. And so you've seen people squeezed on the housing market to the point where, I mean, it, 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 things are absurdly expensive and stuff that's very poorly maintained that's, you know, not particularly spacious, like a, a, a three bedroom apartment that's 750 square feet in very, very poor shape, you know, selling for 600, 700,000 pounds, so close to a million dollars. Um, that kind of situation in places like London. But every time anybody talks about the housing crisis, if you go on tweets, uh, anything online and any anything shared about the housing crisis, particularly if it's shared by conservatives who are acknowledging the fact that there's zero affordable housing, everything is just, you know, beefy dads with St. George's crosses in their profiles talking about, we'll deport all the immigrants and then there'll be plenty of housing. And and, and, and the thing is, that the reason there's a housing crisis is the government sold off, all they, they literally sold housing they built for free for people to them. They were legally required to sell it. They didn't allow councils to reinvest the dividends they made from selling off housing at pennies on the pound f- to build new housing. People were buying these these units I'm describing to you that are worth a million dollars were probably sold for the equivalent of fifty or sixty thousand dollars back in the early '80s and up into the '90s. And the, all of this is done because they wanted to create a class of landlords who would fucking vote for them. That's just that was they they said it openly back then and they still do it now. And and yet people blame immigrants for this as if as if it's just immigration and not 40 years of failed policy that's meant to tighten the fucking housing market. And there's a part of me that gets just so frustrated because I don't understand why it is that people look at these social problems that we're experiencing because of oligarchy, because of terrible neoliberalism. And their their reaction is almost it's like it's it's bred into them, like it's in their fucking DNA to suddenly turn around and be like, oh, yeah, well, I'm mad because houses are too expensive. But if black people didn't have houses, then they wouldn't be expensive. And it's just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like. But that's that, that 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 thought is so common amongst, and I say boomers, but you know, boomers of the mind, because there wouldn't be groups like Ivdentity Evropa or whatever the fuck if there weren't dumbass teens and 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 college students who also believe this racist shit. Yeah, they're they're dead. If you if you zoom in close enough on their DNA, the uh, the double helix is actually just a bunch of little KKK hoods that just yeah. Go I was going to say up. it's like damn, damn, lots and lots of burning crosses in your DNA. Right. Amazing. And and you know there is there 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 sometimes is hope. I've I've certainly seen some people get turned around from that shit. Um, but unfortunately, uh, for the most part, they're all just going to remain horrible racist boomers. Though uh, it is it it is um, heartening when you when you do deep dives into like you know uh, toilet paper USA and find out that like all of their advertising is being pointed at boomers and not at college students. Because well you know college students. You know, there, there's still plenty of like racism and uh, identitarianism and and whatnot at that level. Like for the most part, though, those people are uh, not being targeted. Uh, probably because it's a lot easier to convince like an angry, you know, seventy year old man that like immigrants, like Hispanic immigrants, should be dragged out into the desert and shot than it is like to convince your your average like. Um, 23 year old white dude who's just like i mean i don't like them taking my job but also i'm an accountant so i doubt that they will take my job but uh wait you want to you want to do what you want to just like start executing them no man we can't do that uh yeah it's it's a lot easier to do a racism for the people who it's like really been you know for the last 25 years just been their bread and butter is just the the racism of of fox news i gotta say i'm you know, I used to be very mad that my father never had cable growing up, but now I'm very glad of it because he's never been brainwormed by Fox News and he just watches Netflix and uh, and is a uh, democratic socialist who I who I convinced not to vote for Biden if he's ever uh, if he wins the, the 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 democratic election. So there's there's hope out there, guys. You just gotta you you gotta like you know use the parental locks on your dad's TV to like block out Fox News. And I'll, I'll just say this. I'm also glad my parents don't watch Fox News because they don't really watch TV at all. Uh, besides my mom watching Sky, which is a British news network. Um, but all I can say is to Identity Europa, you spelled Europa wrong. Owned. <laughs> no, see, they're putting the V in there just like them because the, the 
I guess Greek society is what they're the Romans. The Rom- yeah, I mean, the Rom- the yeah, exactly. Rome, a fa- famously a not multi ethnic society. Right. Yeah, these pe- these people have these weird fixations on on Western culture as if like Western people or European people are homogenous in any way. And I mean, the reason why French is pretty easy to learn if you can get through the conjugations is because half of the words in English are the same as French because the French fucking invaded England and like half of this country is are, are, are people who were indigenous in a sense, but there were so many thousands of migrations over centuries and millennia before. And then the other half are basically from Normans who lived here who were who were interbred with natives like. This is not a homogenous society. It never has been. And the idea of like statue Twitter and all that shit hinges on like a 10th grade understanding of the of, of, of ethnicity in general. And then and it obviously just like weaponizes false information to make people believe that like, you know, Western Europe has to be defended. It's weird how we spend all this effort and time and money and human lives to destroy Hitler's fortress Europe. And then like the people who benefited the most from the largesse of the fucking baby boom and, you know, the Marshall Plan and all the post-war welfare state spending have turned around and be like, actually, fortress Europe was a good idea. Hitler, he was just uh, misunderstood. Uh, he was an art student. He was a sensitive man. Well, it, it's like Candace Owens whole like I... You know where, where she said that Hitler was okay until he tried to, uh, you know, do he until he uh, went on a uh, a tour of uh, um, of Europe. Yeah, he, Hitler was bad once he started doing stuff outside of Germany. It's like, right. oh, so you were cool with forced sterilizations and concentration camps and like women being forced to have abortions. Like that was cool. Like you were cool with Kristallnacht. Yeah, like they were putting people in concentration camps right away. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But yeah, these people don't read books because they're morons. Because they but, basically just have like a weird meal ticket paid for by rich boomers who don't want to pay taxes. And and I will say the uh, the the last thing I'll, I'll say before we before we wrap up. Somebody once pointed out that like anytime somebody uh, like a conservative tries to do this, like, well, you know, uh, if you know, socialism and communism won't work if you just study economics one hundred and one. Like, okay, can you go to economics 201, please? Can you go to, like, anything beyond the 101 level? Because, you know, just like hi- history, like, well, you know, in in history 101, yes, you get a, a broad overview of, uh, of the Romans. And maybe there's a very good chance that you are misunderstanding exactly the, the, the length and the width of uh, how the Roman Empire worked and all the people that were involved in it and how, yes, they were bad, but also, yes, they were good in some ways. And instead of like, you know, like people get like literal degrees in just the Roman empire. So you need to stop doing this history or economics 101 and go to more college, please. Um, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna, you know, try to use these as a, as a way to, to own the libs, because most of us are a little bit smarter than that. And just saying economic, saying it's history 101 is where you get um, the Civil War was about a state about states' rights, and history 201 is where you say yes, but a state's rights to do what? Uh, and, and and anyway, that's why you should spray paint over all Confederates. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know what? If we had free college for everyone, free trade school for everyone, and better public education in America, you wouldn't have to learn this dumb racist shit that's not true. But hey, you know what? Different strokes. We'll get there at some point. Or. <laughs> Or everything will just catch on fire, and uh, well, yeah, we'll all burn co- to death. And, yeah, uh, the, the, and in 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 two billion years, the cockroach, uh, whatever sentient cockroach comes up, they they can maybe try to do it again. All right, everybody, thank you uh, so much. You can follow me at Army Strang, follow Nate at In These Deserts, follow the podcast at Hell of a Way. Uh, we are coming up on ooh, it is the end of August now, so September is, or I'm sorry, the end of July. Um, so August is when this is coming out. That's the last month for uh putting in for the zine if you want to do that ten dollars a month on the patreon Uh, i'm going to get some stickers printed out and sent out um probably some new patches as well uh let's see we've got the youtube follow us on youtube we're getting a lot of subscribers um i'm getting back into doing uh weekly lives uh things are starting to uh be a little bit easier for we haven't sold the house yet but at least the house is clean and we keep it clean on a regular basis. So I'm having more time to do those. So we're getting back into doing video content. Uh, you know, we've got the Patreon. We've got uh, shit. What else do we have? We got everything, man. Just uh, you know, keep keep doing what you do with us. Um, we're very happy. We're very grateful to everybody who uh, throws a couple bucks our way um, or just. Uh, you know, shares us with their friends. Our most recent bonus episode is our Q and A, um, where 
Nate and I take questions from all of you and uh, throw out some answers. So uh, we have a, a nice, uh, you know, a lot of different things that we do for uh, for the Patreon. So if you like what we do here and you want something a little bit different, but still with uh, myself and Nate, uh, you know, jump up on that shit and, uh, and get with it. So uh, again, thank you. And Nate, we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Have a good one. Zoom.